This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Welcome everyone to the special 19 Weeks of Blessing program. It is uh, my great fortune. You know, growing up as a kid, one of my favorite books was Tales Out of Shul. But I never would have imagined in my wildest dreams that I would have the privilege of giving a class from Out of Shul. So it's a really distinct uh, privilege and pleasure to be speaking to the Beth Jacob uh, community of Atlanta and uh, Bershus, uh, Rabbi Feldman and Rabbi Faxbrunner. Thank you so much for giving me this uh, suchus and this great privilege to share with you some thoughts about the ninth bracha of Shemona Esrei, Barech Aleinu. And let's begin by noting that this is the only bracha, with the exception of the first bracha, which of course begins Baruch Ata, which begins with a blessing. This is the only blessing of uh, the 19 blessings that begins with the word Barech, with a word which is similar to the word Baruch, blessing. So that certainly gives us a clue that of all the blessings of Shemona Esrei, the ninth blessing is one that symbolizes blessing and bracha more than any other. Let's begin with the very interesting comments of the Tor, the son of the Rush. The Tor, of, co- of course, codified the main corpus of halacha into four general categories of halacha and the laws of prayer the Torah categorizes in uh, what is called the section of Oirachayim, the way of life. And the Torah says that the ninth blessing of Shemona Esrei has 30 words. And the Torah says, what is the significance that this is the ninth blessing of Shemona Esrei? And the Torah quotes the Gemara Megillah on where the Gemara says, why is the ninth blessing of Shemona Esrei about sustenance, parnasa? It's interesting, you know, humorously people say that all of a sudden when it comes to the ninth blessing of Shemona Esrei, everybody wakes up and people are davening and praying with great intent and great devotion because after all, yes, we want Beis HaMikdash and we want Mashiach and we want, but, but we know we all want to make a buck. People are interested and very concerned about their livelihood. And the Gemara asks, why is this the ninth blessing of Shemona Esrei? And the Gemara says something quite amazing. The Gemara says that one's livelihood is very much dependent on the economy and whether prices are real or whether they're inflated. And if you look in the ninth chapter of Tehillim of Psalms, King David of Ramelech prays, that God should destroy those who jack up the prices. What the Gemara refers to as the Mafkiyei Sha'arim, those who cause inflation. So since King David, since David HaMelech, prays for the stability of the economy in the ninth paragraph, in the ninth chapter of Tehillim of Psalms, so too the Anshei Knesset HaGdoyla, the men of the great assembly who formulated the Shemona Esrei, they formulated that we pray for sustenance in the ninth blessing of Shemona Esrei. And that's certainly of note. Who cares that David prayed for the downfall of those who jack up the prices in the ninth chapter of Psalms? Why does that have to be connected to Shemona Esrei? Furthermore, the Torah asks, why are there 30 words in the bracha of Barich Aleinu? Barich Aleinu Hashem Lekeinu Hashanah Hazois blessed upon us, Hashem our God, this year, and all the various types of produce for good. This bracha has 30 words. The same talumat el bracha, and give, do, and rain for blessing. So if you add the words of the same talumat el bracha as we do in the winter, Adam on the face of the earth, and satisfy us from your goodness, and bless our years like the good years, this, of course, is Nosach Ashkenaz, Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed are you God, Mavarech Hashanim, the one who blesses the years. If you count out these number of words, you have 30 words. Says the Torah, what is the significance of 30 words in this blessing of Shemona Esrei? Says the Holy Torah, because in the Chumash, there are two psukim that speak about God's bounty and sustenance that He offers the Jewish people in the world. One is a Pasuk in Devarim, Yiftach Hashem Lecha, God should open up for you, as Itzaray Hatoif, His good storehouse. Eis HaShamayim, the heavens. La Seis Metar Arzacha Be'itai, to give the rain of, that your land needs at its right time. 
and to bless all of your handiwork. You will lend to the nations, you will not have to borrow. So this Pasuk speaks about God opening up the heavens and giving us rain and giving us bounty. This verse has 23 words. Furthermore, the Pasuk, which we know as the quintessential Pasuk describing God's sustenance to mankind, Paiseach es Yadecha, God, you open up your hand, Umazbia, and you satisfy, Lecholchai, to every living thing, Ratzon, their desire. So this Pasuk has seven words. So throughout the Tanakh, the two psukim that describe God's sustenance and life-giving powers of livelihood to man, they are summed up in a total of 30 words. So since there are 30 words in the Tanakh that describe God's sustenance to mankind, therefore, this bracha was formulated with 30 words. And again, you could ask, why is it significant, why is it important that the, br- the blessing with which we ask for sustenance should be paralleled after the number of words that th- describe God's uh, ability to sustain the world in the Tanakh. Why do the, words, why do the number of words have to be specific? Why, why is it of relevance, the number of words in the, in the blessing? So it's, a, it's a quite a remarkable thing. We see that this blessing was paralleled in concept after the chapter of Tehillim that speaks about the economy, as well as the number of words in this uh, blessing are paralleled after the number of words in the Psukim of Tanakh that speak about God giving us sustenance. So I think this opens up for us a very important and fundamental idea about prayer in general, Shemona Esrei specifically. This idea might be a little bit surprising, especially in the context of this particular tefillah program, after all, the function of this program, the objective of this program, which is, uh, I may say, really a remarkable program, <clears throat> is to try to enhance our kavana. But I think we need to, so to speak, redefine what is the purpose of having added kavana in Shemona Esrei. And let's introduce this with um, a comment of a really a fantastic sefer, a wondrous sefer, the name of the Sefer is Magid Meisharem. Magid Meisharem was written by the Beis Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Karo, Rabbi Joseph Karo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch. And he records what he was taught by none other than his holy Chavrusa. And who was the Chavrusa of Rabbi Yosef Karo? Rabbi Yosef Karo learned with a heavenly angel. It's amazing. A human being could study together with an angel. And the angel told Rabbi Joseph Karo, be careful when you pray, not to think extraneous thoughts. Don't even think about Torah. Don't even think about Torah subjects. Ki im betevos hatfila atzmam. Just focus on the words of prayer themselves. Now, let us study these, this teaching of the angel to Rabbi Yosef Karo. The angel taught Rabbi Yosef Karo, don't have extraneous thoughts when you pray, just focus on the words themselves. Reb Chaim Velazhenar, in his classic Sefer Nefesh HaChaim, Shar Aleph, Parak Yud Gimel, the first gate, the thirteenth chapter, the Nefesh HaChaim, Reb Chaim Velazhenar says, listen carefully to these words of the angel. The angel did not tell Rabbi Yosef Karo, think about the meaning of the words. But rather, he said, focus on the words themselves. Which means, when you say the words of Shemona Esrei, the objective is to picture those words in your mind and just focus on unleashing those words. The intent and the understanding of the meaning of the words are almost secondary to focusing on just unleashing those words themselves. Says Rav Chaim Balazhenar, do you know who composed Shmona Esrei? It was composed by the men of the Great Assembly. We're talking about people who, some of them, were prophets. Mordechai, Ezra. When these 120 men sat down to compose the prayer, they were not using literary ability, poetic license. Instead, they were divinely inspired to compose those words that would effectuate in the heavens and all the various realms and worlds, that which we are trying to 
accomplish. They use the prophetic spirit to, u- to compose these specific words because they knew these words have the spiritual energy and power to unlock from Shamayim that which we are asking for, whether it's Rifa'inu, whether it's for healing. They knew that these wor- combination of words, these letters, the- this system, this <coughs> paragraph requesting from God healing, those words were then injected and laid in with spiritual nuclear energy to effectuate from heaven healing. And in our bracha, the Anshei Knesset Del understood that to gain sustenance from heaven for God Almighty to send down from His throne of glory sustenance through the various sephiros which are <clears throat> mystical realms, and for that sustenance to emanate from on high and trickle down, 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 down through the various spiritual channels until it materializes and concretizes in this world, the way to access that is through the power of these divinely inspired words. And that is one of the reasons why it is important, if one is able to, to make every attempt to pray in Hebrew. Certainly if one is not, uh, doesn't understand the language, at times we will allow one to recite the, the prayer in a language they understand for, for more meaningful prayer. However, once a person is able to read the words of Hebrew, even if they don't understand it, it almost doesn't matter. Whether you understand it or not, the words themselves contain spiritual nuclear energy because they were not composed by poets and literary geniuses, although they were. It was composed by prophets. And they knew these words are what it takes to access Parnassah from heaven. And now we understand part of their divine prophecy was trying to parallel the blessing after what chapter... In Tehillim, where certainly David HaMelech understood the workings of the heavens, and he prayed for the economy in the ninth chapter of Tehillim, and therefore, the way to access uh, uh, sustenance is in the ninth blessing of Shemona Esrei. Thirty words, because that's the number of words in the Tanakh, in the scriptures, about God's ability to sustain us. The Nefesh HaChayim says, more important than knowing the meaning of the words is just focus on saying the words. I'll give you an analogy. You don't have to know how a computer works for it to work. If you're typing something and you need to type the word prayer, P-R-A-Y-E-R, it's not really at all important to understand why when you press the letter P that the... (laughs) the letter P will appear on your screen. You don't have to know the computer code or how it works in any way. All you need to do is press the key accurately. Press that key, tap it correctly, tap it definitively, give it the right amount of energy in the tap, and that's all you really need to know. And it will do what it needs to do because the computer programmer programmed it to do what it does and what it does best. It's the same thing with prayer. You don't have to know how prayer works. You almost don't even have to know what the words mean. And, and uh, I'm reluctant to say this in a series about the translation and meaning of prayer. But before we understand the meaning of prayer, it is important to know. The words themselves carry inherent value and meaning. So even if you don't know what the words, Barech Aleinu Hashem Aleikeinu Sashan Hazois, bless upon us, Hashem our God, this year, The first thing we need to know is the men of the Great Assembly already programmed that when those words are said correctly and accurately, it will access Parnasam and Hashemayim. The great objective of learning the meaning of the words, in a way, it doesn't make the tefillah more effective per se. What it does is, it makes the tefillah more meaningful to us and our heartfelt intention and devotion will enhance the tefillah. But, the tefillah will do what it does almost regardless of whether we are thinking of the meaning of the words or not. And as reluctant as I am to say that, 
This is what Rav Chaim Velazhner teaches us. Surely, our enhanced kavana will enhance the efficacy, but it will be effective regardless. Um, I'll give you an analogy from this week's parsha. This week's parsha is Parshas Vayechi. And in Parshas Vayechi, Parak Memtes, Pasuk Chafdei, chapter 49, verse 22, Yaakov Avinu tells Yosef, Va'ani nasati lecha, and I have given to you, Shechem Echad, an extra portion alachecha over your brothers. And you know where I got this portion from? Asher lokach dimiyad ha'amori, I took it from the Emirates, Becharbi, with my sword, uvekashti, and with my bow. Uh, Yaakov Avinu says, I won this property fair and square with my sword and with my bow. But if you look in the Targum, if you look in the Aramaic translation of Unklas, he translates the word, Becharbi with my sword, Bitsaloisi, with my prayer, uvekashti, and with my bow, uvevausi, with my request. So instead of translating the words that Yaakov won Shechem, with physical brute strength, Yaakov is saying, I gained Shechem through my prayer. But he uses two different terminologies of prayer. His sword and his bow. His standard prayer and his request. Rav Meir Simcha of Devinsk, the Meshachachma explains, that there are two elements of prayer. There is the standard prayer, which was formulated by the men of the Great Assembly, and that is the Shemona Esrei that we say every day, and that is likened to a sword. In Halacha, any sword which is metal, if somebody kills somebody with it, even with a small amount of force, they are liable for murder because metal has the inherent ability to kill. So too, our standard prayers were already injected and laden with all the force that they need. We just need to unleash them. And then, of course, we have our personal prayer. When we have personal needs that we cry out to God from the depth of our heart in our own word, and those prayers are only as meaningful as the sincerity and devotion that we put into them. But we have to recognize there is an element of standard prayer. And this, this great series will enhance the meaning of the prayer to us. But recognize that prayer is effective whether we understand it or not. And that is because the words themselves carry incredible power because they were composed by the greatest of men, namely the men of the Great Assembly, the Anshei Knesset Sagdola. Now, let's come to Baruch Aleinu because this is a blessing for, or a request for sustenance. And certainly in our times this has many levels of meaning because we don't just want corn and, um, and uh, carrots and wheat and barley, even though us in New York, we think everyone in Atlanta is a farmer, you know, sorry, you know, that's how just, we think it's an agricultural society, but of course we know that most people are not working in the fields, and people's livelihood depends on uh, commerce, and business, and uh, stocks, and bonds, and mutual funds, and uh, economy. And that is certainly included in... Um, the words, uh, bless upon us this year, not just our fields, but our commerce. Bless our years, like the good years. We know there were years where the stock market really rose. We know there were years where the economy was really booming, and that is what we pray for every single day. And the question is, friends, why do we need to pray daily for sustenance? Isn't one, the, one of the basic tenets of our emuna, one of the basic tenets of our belief is that on Rosh Hashanah, God decrees how much money a person is going to make that year. And whether a person works more or works less, they're going to get what was predestined. So the one thing it would seem not necessary to pray for daily and certainly three times a day is sustenance. Hasn't it already been decided on Rosh Hashanah? And this is a very fundamental question, and uh, it is addressed by none other than the Ram Chalra of Moshe Chaim Lutzato in his classic work, Dar Hashem. And Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato speaks about the central role that prayer has to play in the, in the life of a Jew, and he says that it is God's most basic desire and deepest desire to provide every Jew and every human being with a bounty of livelihood. 
not just for your basic necessities, but to live in comfort and ample livelihood. However, God programmed the world that He only gives it if mankind attempts to come closer to Him, and that is the conduit through which God bestows parnasa and bounty on man. So yes, it was decreed that this year we should make $250,000 at least. However, we still have to pick up the check. In other words, just because the boss has the check waiting for you in his office, you still got to go get it. Not every boss is direct deposit into your account. And God does not do direct deposit. God says, yes, I've decreed how much money you're going to earn this year, but it's contingent upon you coming close to me. I don't want you leaving anything in the escrow. Yes, I decreed how much you're going to make this year, but you got to come and get it. And the way we come and get it is by coming closer to Hashem. That is the conduit and the channel through which God bestows upon us. But then the the Derech Hashem shares with us and really bequeaths to the Jewish people a gem of, of an idea. The Derech Hashem teaches us that the way God set up that we make a living is we go to work. Now going to work, although it has a great advantage of earning a paycheck, it has a great disadvantage. Because we co- become very involved and immersed in physicality and gashmias. Gashmias, the physical world. One could be working in an office and one gets carried away thinking, this is all dependent on me. My acumen, my good ideas will earn me the paycheck. And one begins to lose focus of God. One could be in an office where the environment is uh, less than worthy, where perhaps people are speaking in a low manner, perhaps people are dressed in an indecent manner. Going to work has a certain danger, challenge, and pitfall to it. What, could, what, what is our safety net that we don't get dragged down by making a living? That the workplace, that the environment, that the immersion in our handiwork doesn't r- take us away from Hashem. And our safety net is Shmona Esrei, prayer. Because before we go to work, during our work, we're praying, God, help me out. Give me parnasa, Help me be successful. So that what that does is it puts a framework that even if I'm at work now for the next nine hours, I'm not going to get dragged down because I understand that whatever I'm about to do is dependent on God's goodwill. So, well, how do I know that I'm aware of that? Well, you prayed, didn't you? Didn't you enunciate the concept that you believe that your success is dependent on God? So when we go to work, our work is now being framed in Bare Chaleinu. We're, we're going to be careful now that we don't get carried away and think, well, this is all dependent on yadi, my own acumen, my own handiwork. I'm not going to get drawn after the physical environment of the wor- workplace because I've already declared before I go to work, after I go to work, that this is not a physical activity. This is a divinely assisted activity. God is with me in the workplace. Says in the uh, Ramchal, prayer, especially Bari Chaleinu, will be our safety net to ensure that our, that our working will not pull us away from the Almighty. I would not, now like to present to you a um, remarkable idea. It's not my own idea. This is the thesis of Rav Yeshua Heller, and I told Rabbi Fox Brunner that uh, perhaps my presentation will be a little out of the box, and I hope uh, you'll enjoy it. And um, this was really eye-opening to me. There is a comment in the Yushalmi. The Yushalmi was talking about um, various Amoraim who had a difficult time focusing during the Shemona Esrei. These comments of the Yushalmi could be found in Yushalmi Brachais, Parak Beis, Halacha Dalet. Shmuel said, This is how I ensure that I have Kavana by Shemona Esrei. Shmuel Amar, Ana Monis Efreichaya. I count the birds. Don't we all, right? What in the world does Shmuel mean that the way he has Kavan and Shmon Esra is by counting the birds? Well, Rav Yeshua Heller wrote an entire compendium explaining this statement of Shmuel that he counts the birds in order to facilitate his Kavan by Shmon Esra. 
And Rabbi Shua Heller explains as follows. If you look in Parshas Shemini, if you look in Parshas Re'e, that speak about the birds that you're allowed to eat, the birds you're not allowed to eat, so, biblically, we're allowed to eat any bird as long as it's, it's not on the list of 19 or 20 birds that are mentioned in Parshas Shemini and Re'e, respectively. In fact, in the list, in one of the lists, there are 21 birds. In one list, there are 20 birds. However, if you look in the Gemara in Chulen, the Gemara in Chulen teaches us, and this Gemara is found on Daf Samach Gimel Bez. the Gemara says that Aya and the Daya are all one bird. The Gemara says further, the Da'a, the Ra'a, and the Aya, they're all one bird. Knowing that, if you then count the number of non-kosher birds mentioned in these parshios, you have 19 non-kosher birds. Says Rabbi Yeshua Heller, there is no question that everything in the physical world reflects the spiritual world. The 19 non-kosher birds reflect 19 avenues of sustenance that mankind and the Jewish people are dependent on God. The 19 non-kosher birds correspond to the 19 bl- blessings of Shemona Esrei. And if you want to really understand each blessing of Shemona Esrei, you have to study the bird that corresponds to that particular blessing. I'll give you an example and we'll come right away to the, the blessing of Bar Chalino. The first blessing listed in, the first bird listed in Parsha Shmini and Parsha Re'e is the Nesher. What is the defining characteristic of the Nesher? Well, Rashi tells us. Now, there is actually a dispute. What is the Nesher? Is it the uh, eagle or is it the vulture? Let's go with the uh, traditional interpretation that it's the eagle. The eagle is the highest flying bird. And Rashi tells us in Parshas Yisrael that all other birds carry their young in their arms because they're afraid of a predator coming down, swooping down and taking their child away from them. So they carry their child in their arms. However, the Nesher is the highest flying bird. It has no worries that a bird will swoop down upon it. What it is worried about is maybe a human being will shoot from below a missile or a projectile and hit their young. So the Nesher, the highest flying bird, flies with its young on its wings. And it says, I don't have to worry about anyone flying above me. I only have to worry about the projectile that might hit my young. Better the projectile hit me and I will be what? For my young, I will be a shield for my young. I will take, I will take it on the chin. I will take the bullet in me to protect my young. You want to conjure up an image of what God means when He, when we say, "Magen Avram." You want to understand what it means that God is the shield of Abraham and the shield of the Jewish people. Conjure up the image of the Nesher, the eagle, who's willing to take a bullet in it and protect its young. God also says, when I took you out of Egypt, I carried you like on the wings of the eagle, like I took you in my Anani, I covered my clouds of glory. And when the Egyptians were sh- shooting projectiles, I said, better it should hit me and I will protect you. So if you want it, the imagery of Magen Avraham, think about the Nesher, the eagle, and you'll understand what it means that God is the shield of Abraham. We are now in the ninth blessing. And therefore, the ninth bird mentioned in Parshas Shmini is none other than the Nates. And the Nates is the sparrow hawk. And if you really and truly want to understand the blessing of Bar and if you'll ask, what do you mean? I looked in Parshas Shmini, that's not the ninth bird. Remember what I told you. The Aya, the Daya, the Ra, they're all one bird. And in fact, the ninth bird then is the Nates, the sparrow hawk. And the sparrow hawk, if we could study this bird for a a few brief moments, we will gain a deeper appreciation and a a fuller imagery of what we should think when we say the bracha of Baruch The issue is that we don't exactly know what a nates is, we, for convenience purposes, translate it as sparrow hawk. And of course, if we want to understand what this bird is, we have to go to a very mysterious Gemara. So I invite you to join me for some uh, bird study in a Gemara in Baba Basra and Dav 
The Gemara says that four winds blow every day. The north, the south, the east, and the west. And the north wind blows with all the other winds. Other world, otherwise, the world cannot exist. Says the Gemara, the harshest of all the, we- the winds is the southern wind. And if not for the Ben Nates, literally the son of the sparrowhawk, that stops the south wind, what would have, it would destroy the world. In other words, the south wind threatens to destroy the world. That wind from the south threatens to destroy the world. And who stops it? The Nates. Rashi on the Gemara says, What is it, the Nates? The Nates is an angel that resembles the bird Nates. So now we're getting very close because our blessing of Baruch Aleinu is the blessing that we're supposed to imagine the Nates. And now we're saying the world would be destroyed if, um, by the southern wind if not for an angel that looks like a sparrow hawk. What is the meaning of this? The Ibn Ezra, one of the classic medieval commentators on Parsha Shmini says, what kind of bird is a nates? Friends, the word nates is a language of notsa, feathers. It's a bird with a lot of feathers. It's always shedding its feathers, constantly, annually, even more often. Fe- a proliferation of feathers. Says Rabbi Shua Heller, an amazing concept, everything in the physical world, in the inanimate world, has a reflection in the plant world, has a reflection in the animal world, has a reflection in the spiritual world. And this is brought out by a fascinating Gemara in Bechoros, on Dav Ches. The Gemara says a chicken, its incubation period is 21 days, and a almond tree is also 21 days. And the Gemara says a dog gives its, takes 50 days to produce its young, corresponding to that is a fig tree. What we learn from here is what exists in the world of plants, there is a corresponding reflection in the world of animal, and taking it higher up, there is a corresponding reflection in the human world and in the spiritual world. The nates is a bird that constantly sheds its feathers. It's so, it has so much beneficence, it is so plentiful, it has so much fruits, it's so bountiful, it's always shedding feather after feather after feather. And therefore in the spiritual world, there is an angel that also represents and reflects the world of bounty and beneficence and, and ample livelihood. That is why there is this southern wind that threatens to destroy the world and who will stand up to it to ensure that there is livelihood in the world and that crops do grow and that agriculture is successful. An angel that looks like the bird nates. The word nates, we have in Shir Hashirim, in the Song of Songs, He Neitsu Harimonim, the pomegranates are flourishing. Nitsanim is a language of proliferation, sprouting, flourishing, vitality. This bird, the nates, is a, is a lush bird, a bird that gives off so much feathers. In other words, if you want to know, what is the imagery with which we should use to pray to God for, for Parnassah? Don't just ask God, God, I have $90,000 in bills this year, give me exactly $90,000. God could do more than that. We can ask God for a very ample livelihood, for a comfortable livelihood. Of course, we're not looking for luxury and we're not looking to be uh, immersed in the excess physicality of this world. But certainly, we have every right to ask our loving God to give us ample livelihood. And if you want to know the proper imagery to use when making this bracha, think about the nates, the sparrowhawk, which is, a, which is a bird that represents great proliferation, great blessing, great livelihood. And I would like to suggest, that's why of all the blessings of Shemona Esrei, this is the bracha that begins with the word baruch, with the exception of the first, because this is the blessing asking God for ample Blessing. By the way, the Maral says the word Baruch, each letter, Bez is 2, Chaf is 20, Resh is 200. Each letter represents more than one, proliferation, blessing, ample livelihood. And this is what we ask from our loving God, Rebbe Give us breathing room, give us 
excess blessing. Give us a lot of parnasa, And we are confident that the, the Rebbe Hashem will listen to our tefillah, especially with our, in the merit of us ga- gathering together. What a wonderful program it is for us to gather together so many um, holy Jews weekly to understand our prayers better. If I could share with you two more ideas, very brief ideas. The Gemara Megillah that we mentioned on Daf Yudzayin discusses why is the blessing following Baruch Haleinu to Kabe Shofar, which is heralding the redemption. And the Gemara says uh, something amazing. But I want to introduce it with the Pasuk in Ezekiel, Yechezkel, Perk Lamed Vav, Pasuk Ches, where the verse says, V'atem hare Yisrael, and you mountains of Israel, an pechem titenu, Give forth your branches, uparichem tisu, bear your fruit, la'ami Yisrael, to my nation Israel. Ki kervu lavai. They're almost here. And the Gemara Sanhedrin on page Tzadi Ches Amad Aleph says that this verse in Yecheskel is the most open clue to when the redemption is coming. Listen carefully to the verse. The verse says, you mountains of Israel, give forth your fruit because the Jewish people are coming. The Gemara says, Ein lecha keitz megula mizeh. There is no more open, revealed sign of the redemption. Friends, do you know what the greatest sign is that Mashiach is almost here? The abundance of fruits and the strength of the economy of the land of Israel. Because the verse is saying, Mountains of Israel, give forth your fruits because the children of Israel are coming. Meaning, if you want to know what heralds the redemption, first sign is the proliferation of fruits in Israel. By the way, we could suggest that Tu B'Shvat, which is coming soon, which is only 40 days before the process of Nisan. Nisan, of course, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, is the day that God created the world, according to Rabbi Shua. That, that began really on the 25th day of Adar, six days earlier. That, and we believe that God created the world in Nisan. The redemption will occur in Nisan. But that process began the 25th day of Adar. And there's a concept that 40 days before a process begins is the conception of that process. The conception of that process, of course, is Tu B'Shvat. And then it comes out there is a very strong connection between abundance of fruit in the land of Israel and the process of redemption. As we are learning, the most open, revealed sign of the redemption of the Jewish people are the abundance of fruits. In fact, the Marsha explains that historically, when the Jewish people are not in the land of Israel, the land is barren, the land is in drought, the land is empty, it's desolate. I'm sure you all know of the writings of Mark Twain where he describes the, the desolation of the land of Israel in the 19th century or when he traveled through the land and he speaks about it as a dreadful, dreary place. And we know Israel today is uh, one of the most um, strongest economies and it's a land that's producing remarkable peros and fruits and abundance and that is a very promising and exhilarating uh, feeling, recognizing that the agriculture of the land of Israel beckons the Jewish people to return and beckons the redemption. And that is why Bari Chaleinu is immediately followed by Tekah B'Shofar Gadol. So an additional kavana and intent that we should try to have when we say Bari Chaleinu is God, bless our agriculture, bless our bank accounts, bless our, sto- our stocks, bless our portfolio. But specifically, bless the land of Israel, not just so that the land of Israel should have a strong economy, so, so that the abundance of fruits of the land of Israel should beckon and herald the coming of Mashiach and the coming of the redemption. So Baruch Aleinu is not just a request for our own bank accounts, but it's also sort of the beginning of the request for the ultimate redemption. But let us add one additional thought. You know, it struck me. We have so many requests in Shemona Esrei, and there's only one thing we don't ask for. How about life? Why don't we ask God, God, keep us alive. Perhaps. The Gemara Masech Tainas tells us an account. Tells us a little story. The Gemara tells us that in the times of Shmor Bar, Bar Nachmini, this could be found in Masech Tainas, there were two problems. There was famine, 
there was hunger, and there was plague, people were dying. And they had a dilemma. What should they pray for? We would say, look, if you can only pray for one of the two, pray to be alive. It beats the alternative. But the Gemara says they had a dilemma. So you say pray for both. The Gemara says when there's tr- double trouble, you need to focus on one thing. So should they focus on the drought? But if they have food, but people are dying, should they focus on the plague? But they're not going to have food. This was the halachic ruling. Pray for livelihood and sustenance. Pray for food. Because when God gives food, and He gives sustenance, He gives it to the living. As the verse says, Paiseach es yadecha, you open up your hand, umas and you satiate l'chol chai, to every living being, rats on their desire. God gives sustenance to the chayim. So the Gemara says this was sort of a backhanded way of praying for two things. If you pray for life, you may not have food. If you pray for food, God automatically gives food to the living. We started this year saying there are 30 words in Bari Chaleinu, corresponding to the 23 words of Yiftach Hashem L'cha Saitzare HaToiv, the verse in Devarim about God opening His storehouse, and and corresponding to the seven words of the Pasuk. God, you open up your hand, and you satisfy every living being's desire. By praying for Bari Chaleinu, we are not just praying for sustenance, we are praying for life as well. We're saying, God, provide for us, grant us stable finances, grant us a good job, grant us an easy job, grant us good livelihood. But perforce, part of that, part and parcel of that request is, give it to us as living entities. Be Open up your hand and satisfy the desire of every living being. So in the times we're living in, There are many struggling from uh, the strain that the the COVID has placed on the economy. And there are many who also want to pray, God, please keep us alive. But perhaps an important juncture to have in mind, Rebunisham, strengthen our economy and keep us alive, is in this blessing, Baruch Haleinu. God, open your generous hand and satisfy us with your kindness, with your ample livelihood, and by doing so, it should be L'chaim. So my blessing to all of you is L'chaim. May God watch over all of you, grant all of us ample livelihood, grant us good health, grant us life and all of its blessings. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Bracha v'hatzlacha and a wonderful evening. Kol Tov Salah. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.